There is a healer His love is deeper than the sea His mercy is unfailing His arms a fortress for the weak Let faith arise Let faith arise I lift my hands to believe again You are my refuge You are my strength Pour out my heart These things I remember Hey, everybody. Hey, good morning. Hey, did you hear the great news? The good news? We have, did you hear it? Jesus is alive? Well, of course. Did okay. you hear the other good news? What's the good news? The other great news. What's the great news? We're going to regather on Father's Day, June 21st. We're going to be right here in the parking lot. You can bring a blanket, sit in the grass. You can bring a lawn chair, sit on the concrete. But we're going to regather on June 21st. The uh, building will be open. Uh, we'll have the bathrooms and everything open in there. There will be no children's programming on the 21st, but Hey, we want you to come out and hang out with us. We'll see you then. It's going to be fantastic.
morning, everybody. I just want to remind you that God loves you, even in the midst of what we're experiencing, that he, he really does love you. You must remember this. He's interested in your growth in Christ-likeness, not necessarily your comfort. He's all-powerful, even in the midst of turmoil and chaos and even the mayhem. You know what? I think God, perhaps, might be allowing America, specifically, and humanity in general, to reap what we sow. Maybe he's giving us over to our, our idolatry, our immorality, even our injustice, actually granting us the consequences of our sin. I think we can trust God even when he doesn't immediately come to our rescue. I don't think he's turned a blind eye to us. He loves us and he's interested in our spiritual growth. And by spiritual growth, I'm talking about our growth in Christ-likeness. Our vision, it must stay in focus. The world is not as it should be. You see, creation's goodness was tarnished the day that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's one command. And so we're living in the aftermath. That's what we're experiencing right now. Humanity has wrecked God's good creation. And as a result, creation is groaning. Followers of Jesus are groaning. Holy Spirit is groaning. And we're groaning for God to complete His plan of salvation. If you wonder where I understand that from, look up Romans chapter 8. And so creation, faithful followers of Christ, as well as Holy Spirit, long for the day when Christ returns and God's children are revealed. Until then, we have to wait, just as God is waiting. I think the words of Peter seem appropriate. We read them in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should be reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. See what's happening here? See what Peter's telling us? The patience of God allows for repentance. Returning to Him, that's what repentance means. It is returning to Him. It is a realignment of our allegiance. And quite honestly, it's an act of God's grace. The day of the Lord will come. When will that happen? We don't even know that. We know that Jesus didn't know that. But it will come, it will be unexpected, and it will be obvious. It seems to me like suffering in Scripture is usually associated with a call to repentance. And I understand as much as we want humanity's struggle to end, perhaps we should remember the ways in which God has provided for us. I know there are many people who are not um, at ease right now. But maybe we should continue to look to God and see how He's provided for us. The people in our lives that God has given us for mutual encouragement and edification. Remember the opportunities and resources, the knowledge and understanding that He gives us. And more than that, remember the water that He gives us to drink and the air that He gives us to breathe. The sun that warms our planet and even the rain that sustains us. <clears throat> More than that, he blesses those who pledge allegiance to Jesus with spiritual blessings. When was the last time you paused <clears throat> and took time to thank God for his forgiveness and his grace, for his mercy and compassion? When was the last time that we stopped and we praised God for his works of reconciliation and redemption, for his works of justification, adoption, sanctification? and salvation in and through Jesus Christ. It appears to me, as I read Scripture, that God is more interested in our eternal security than He is our momentary comfort. Moreover, those who pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ have been given the gift of Holy Spirit, the very precious gift of God's presence abiding in us. <clears throat> this presence helps us to be different, and it helps us to make a difference. We always have to remember that we are called to be God's representatives in this world. 
And so it's always a great question to ask ourselves. Are we producing love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, gentleness and faithfulness, and that last fruit, self-control? We look outward and we can notice the corrupt, evil, and immoral world. We can see that. It's obvious to us. We condemn the failures of others. But when's the last time that we looked inward and acknowledged our own shortcomings? As we move into the fourth of seven virtues in our sermon series entitled Virtually Essential, we're studying the virtue of trust. Who do we trust right now? Where can we turn to get quality, reliable information? Can we trust the politicians? Can we trust the medical professionals? Are they really telling us the truth? I think there's a level of skepticism and cynicism that leave, leave us wondering what to believe. Can God be trusted? I'm here to remind you today, and this is what I want you to know, is that we can trust God because He is dependable. We pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ trusting that God is up to something because God is always up to something. When times of desolation and darkness, of depression and dryness come, we stand firm in our unwavering trust in God. I like what St. Augustine says. He put it this way. Trust the past to the mercy of God, the present to His love, and the future to His providence. Is that a good description of your spiritual focus right now? We know that NASA and SpaceX teamed up to send two American astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil, something that hasn't occurred in over a decade. It was an amazing thing to witness. You see, the astronauts, they put their trust in scientists whose expertise assured a correct course to their destination. Whatever our course is in life right now, we should receive it as the highest gift from the hand of God. We know that life is full of moments and events and circumstances, whether good or bad, that draw us to God and lead us to a, a place of repentance. Trust. Trust in God's work. Trust in His expertise. I think if we take an inventory of our lives, we can see <clears throat> when God has blessed us, who He has blessed us with, how He has blessed us, how much He has blessed us, and for whom He has blessed us. Yes, even that last one. For whom He has blessed us. Understand that God's gifts to us are not just for ourselves, they're for the sake of other people. As followers of Christ, we're not on this planet. We don't pledge allegiance to Jesus simply for ourselves. We are to share the blessings with others. We live for others. That God provides, there is no doubt. There's a famous psalm, Psalm 23, that reminds us of God's provision. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Our righteousness, understand, is for His name's sake. It's not for our sake. It is for Him. You see, right living brings honor to God's name. We are representative of Him and our lives bear witness to the name that we bear. His name. In the Gospel of John, we get a glimpse of the shepherd in action. In chapter 6, we read the account of Jesus feeding 5,000. In verse 4, we discover that the Passover is near. And when it comes to the Passover, at least two things should come to mind. First, God's providing deliverance and redemption as revealed in a living in Israel's departure from Egypt to the Red Sea. And the second thing is the miraculous feeding of the people with manna for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. God not only rescues His people, He sustains them. These themes are taken up by Jesus in John chapter 6. We pick it up in verse 5. 
lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Boy, this sounds familiar. It reminds us of the multitude in the desert. And it reminds us of Moses' question. Where can I get meat for all these people to eat? Numbers chapter 11, verse 13. We pick it up in verse 6 of John chapter 6. And he said this to test him. Did you hear that? He said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? This reminds us again of some of the words of Moses. Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? He said that is recorded in Numbers chapter 11, verse 22. See what's happening here? Jesus tests in order to get a response, to see what the response will be. And I believe that's the same with us. God tests, He tests us to see how we're going to respond. Are we going to trust Him? Are we going to continue to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit? In verse 10, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. This kind of reminds us of the first verse of Psalm 23, does it not? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be, at, be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And so Jesus has the people sit down on the grass. He is God in the flesh, he's the good shepherd among them. Verse 11. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten them. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Ah, the people were satisfied and they want to make Jesus king. I think there's three actions in here on the part of Jesus that we can still expect to happen in our own relationship with him. And the first action is this. Jesus tests our hearts in order to mold them. In her book, Where the Heart Leads, Anita Stansfield writes this. It's not what happens to us that molds us. It's what we do with it that molds us. When things happen, when life gets interesting, when it's a bit difficult or crazy or uncertain, when we are tested by that person or by that situation, God will use that to mold our hearts. He's interested in how we respond. You see, an important part of being a follower of Christ is how we respond to life. And it goes a long way in revealing where our trust truly rests, where our religions is. And so our response reveals our hearts. It reminds me of Psalm 26 too. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. That is an interesting prayer to pray. That's a difficult prayer to pray. Do we really want God to test us? You see, a heart is like a home. It's a place where attitudes are nurtured, Behaviors are developed and choices are made. It's a place where God and His love dwell within us. You see, God wants to help us by shaping our attitudes, developing our behaviors, and influencing our motives and our choices. Are we allowing the tests of life to mold us? James chapter 1. Maybe this is a familiar passage to you. If not, consider what it says. James 1 verse 2. 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The virus, the violence, they're causing unease in many, many people. What is God doing in the midst of this? Is He testing us? Is He testing our faithfulness? And our steadfastness? You see, the heart is like a home. But I would also argue that the heart is like clay. It has the ability to be molded. Everybody's undergoing spiritual formation. Each person's heart is being shaped by someone or something. And so whose voice has an influence in your life right now? Are you overwhelmed with media, whether that's on the TV or social media? Are you allowing your opposition to speak into your life? Maybe it's that inner critic that we all have that, you know, puts a damper on our own self-esteem. Or is it God? Is it His Word, His truth, and His love? Is that what's molding us? You see, in His love, God actually tests us. It is part of the shaping process. It's part of our journey. I find it interesting that the Greek word translated test it is used 38 times in the New Testament. It's used twice in the Gospel of John. You see, it's used when Jesus tests Philip, here in the text we're reading, and when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees try to trap Jesus with a question. We read about that in John chapter 8. What I want you to know is that life is full of tests. They can be relational, they can be economic, they can be moral, they can go on and on. No one is immune to testing. Jesus is interested in how we respond to it. So the heart is like a home. The heart is like clay. I would even argue that the heart is like a garden. When God's Word takes root in us, it has this amazing ability to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And when God's Holy Spirit is allowed to weed out our hearts, we come we become more like Christ, and that fruit will flourish. Of course we know that every garden has weeds. If you've ever been a gardener, you know how often those weeds come up in return. And yet there are steps to take to prevent them from flourishing and growing. Use a herbicide, maybe not. Maybe you just use cardboard, and you put grass clippings on it. I don't know. Steps need to be taken or our gardens will be overrun with weeds. I think our hearts are the same way. If we do not intentionally take appropriate steps, weeds will grow in our hearts. And if we ignore our hearts, they will be overrun with ungodly motives, thoughts, and desires, appetites, behaviors, even our feelings. Perhaps God tests us to help us become aware of the weeds that are in our hearts, so that we can work with Him to remove them. Maybe it's the bitterness, it's the strife, it's the doubt or fear, whatever selfishness resides within us. Does Jesus test the disciples? Does Jesus test Philip to cultivate trust within Him? There's a second action of Jesus, and it's this. Jesus receives our contributions in order to multiply them. You see, a contribution made to God is like an investment. It pays dividends. When we make our contributions to God's kingdom, the dividends are amazing. People are helped. I'm standing here in the midst of the food pantry. And we make con contributions to our offering, or even uh, providing canned goods to our food pantry. We know that people are helped. Our hearts are liberated when we make contributions to God's kingdom, our hearts are liberated from greed and consumerism and that self-centeredness. You know that giving, giving is a holy habit, right? It, and God uses it for our good and for the good of others. And so if you contribute money or your time or food or knowledge or wisdom or skill... Whatever aspect of your life that God wants to use, 
It is an important part of God's economy. And I think it's amazing and it's awesome when we give to God and we allow Him to multiply our gifts for His glory and for His purpose. The Greek word translated distributed, it's used four times in the New Testament. It's used by Jesus when He tells the rich young ruler to sell everything and give it to the poor. It is used to describe how the early church distributed resources for people in need. It is used here in our text to explain how the disciples distributed food to thousands of people from the lunch of a young boy. We must feed on the Word of God. It is so important that we feed on Scripture. It is our source of strength and truth, of wisdom and guidance. Personally, I think it's a beautiful thing when I see people who've been impacted by it, who live according to its truth, multiplying love to everybody that they encounter. I would also argue that when we partner with God, giving Him our contributions, we can expect Him to do great things. <clears throat> we may not see it immediately. We may never see it. But our God uses our contributions to care and provide for others. So does Jesus multiply our resources to cultivate continued trust in us? We give to God trusting that He's going to utilize them and multiply them for His glory. Alright, a third and final action this morning. Jesus discerns our intentions in order to measure them. We measure things for accuracy. Whenever you build a house or maybe a deck or whenever you build something or construct something, correct measurement is essential. Assessment is important. I find it interesting in the text that Jesus measures the intention of the crowd after feeding them. And he discerns how accurate their assessment really is. You see what's happening here, right? Jesus has spiritual insight. He can see in our hearts, and He can recognize our intentions and our motives. What is your purpose in life? Why is this question important? What is your purpose in life? And how does that purpose impact your daily living? Well, if you need a reminder, your purpose in life is to represent Christ and to represent Him well. And the way to do that is to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Realize that the Greek word translated intended is used 109 times in the New Testament. It is used 12 times in the Gospel of John and 2 times in the text we're looking at this morning. So when testing Philip, Jesus actually knows what he intends to do. He knows he's going to grab the boy's lunch and he's going to multiply and feed everybody. Jesus is also aware of what the people intend to do with Him in verse 15. You see, Jesus is the perfect example of a discerning person. He's paying attention, He's listening, and He's looking. And so what do we discover? That the people want to make Him king. We have to understand that Jesus is not an earthly, earthly political figure. His kingdom is not of this world. You read about that in John 18. But they're ready to take him by force and prop him up as king. Who wouldn't want a king that could multiply food anytime he wanted to? But Jesus knows their intentions, and he knows our intentions too. He knows our hearts. Do we possess a heart that trusts in him? Please hear me. We trust in God because he is faithful. We trust in him because he's faithful. Of course we have to eat to survive. We have to eat a physical food because our body requires nourishment. But we also have to eat spiritual food too because our souls require nourishment too. Our food pantry and pantries across the country are feeding those in need. It's an amazing thing to witness and to see. Personally, as representatives of Jesus, we must commit ourselves to eating healthy and ensuring that others don't go hungry. We need the constant reminder that we need to 
feed on our spiritual lives as well. How are we satisfying our spiritual hunger this morning? In what ways are we allowing God to mold a heart of trust within us? Do our lives match the words of the psalmist? Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Him my heart trusts. To do this, we must eat a healthy spiritual diet just as much as we eat a healthy physical diet. And so many are starving their souls in our culture right now. I think we're witnessing the malnourishment of the inner life. Perhaps some of our current struggles are a result of a spiritual famine. People aren't feeding on the Word of God, and they're not living in the Holy Spirit and being led by Him. They're allowing Him... They're not allowing Holy Spirit to control their anger or their appetites. And so perhaps the words of the psalmist resonate. Psalm 38, 8. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. You know how weak and fragile the inner life can be. And when you pile struggles and difficulties and hardship on top of that, it seems like we don't stand a chance. And yet what we do is we feed on the wisdom of God in good times and in bad. And this is the good news, is that God is ready to provide. We read about it again in James chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. You see, our God loves us, and our God cares about us. And we must allow Him to feed us. Because it's only God and God only that provides the food that leads to everlasting life. So what are you eating right now? What is it that you're feeding on? Are you feeding on Jesus? Huh. John chapter 6 verse 35, the same chapter. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Only Jesus can satisfy our spiritual hunger and our spiritual thirst. If only our world could see this. Our vision statement at Bartonville Christian Church is engaging the world with God's love as equipped and empowered followers of Christ. I just asked, and I just called out and said, if only the world could see this. And so my question is, if we're wanting to engage the world with God's love, and if we're wanting to lead people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to be cultivating that relationship ourselves. We can't expect a culture to feed on the bread of life. We can't expect a culture to drink from Jesus if we're not doing that ourselves. So let me give you three quick applications. Let's allow God to shape us like clay in a potter's hand. Let's allow Jesus to shape us like clay in a potter's hand. We read about that in Jeremiah 18. We need to allow the tests and the trials to be molding opportunities. Grow trust Grow faith in God. A second one is let's allow God to send us as His representatives, as representatives of His name. We talk about this in 1 Peter, how we are called God's treasured possession. And we need to allow people to see that within us. And the way we demonstrate that, in part, is by the trust that we allow to build up within us. And then third, let's allow God to search us to uncover our anxious thoughts and our offensive ways. If that molding is to take place, we need to sit with our hearts. And I know that it's not easy to do. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, we sit with God and we allow Him to examine our hearts so that we can root out the weeds that are growing within them. God loves you. 
And I know the world seems crazy right now. But I want you to know that God is dependable and He is faithful and He brings tests and trials to help us grow and become more like His Son. Please allow that to happen in this time. God, we thank You for Your continued presence and we thank You for Your overwhelming power. And we know that there are times we scratch our heads and we wonder, where are you? What are you doing? What are you thinking? <clears throat> Why aren't you rescuing us from all of this? But we also know that these tests and these trials are opportunities for us to grow in faith and trust and allegiance. And I'm praying for the congregation as I pray for myself, that I would continue to focus on you, and focus on your grace and the blessings that you provide. And that we would reach out and we would help others to experience and understand that these blessings are available to them as well. Please help us to be your representatives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The table is where life happens. It's where imagination runs wild. Where lessons are learned. And wonders are built. The table is where time can stop. Where wounds are comforted. And freedom begins. It's where we find peace. And we laugh till it hurts. The table is where we gather with family, new and old, to share stories, to nourish our bodies, to enrich our souls. The table is where we give thanks and where we remember what great gifts we have been given.
my troubled sea Oh, you are peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore Yes. 